to the citizens of the United States. Payne returned to America in 1802 and, as was his wont, plunged himself immediately into political controversy. He published seven letters to the citizens of the United States in the Jeffersonian press between November 1802 and April 1803. An eighth letter appeared in 1805. In the three letters included here, it is clear that joining Washington in the villainous Federalist camp is John Adams, who is described by Paine as hypocritical, arrogant, and contemptuous. After an absence of almost 15 years, I am again returned to the country in whose dangers I bore my share, and to whose greatness I contribute my part. When I sailed for Europe in the spring of 1787, it was my intention to return to America the next year and enjoy in retirement the esteem of my friends and the repose I was entitled to. I had stood out the storm of one revolution and had no wish to embark in another. But other scenes and other circumstances than those of contemplated ease were allotted to me. The French Revolution was beginning to germinate when I arrived in France. The principles of it were good. They were copied from America, and the men who conducted it were honest. But the fury of faction soon extinguished the one and sent the other to the scaffolds. Of those who began that revolution, I am almost the only survivor, and that through a thousand dangers. I owe this not to the prayers of the priest, nor to the petty of the hypocrites, but to the continued protection of providence. But while I beheld the pleasures the dawn of liberty rising in Europe, I saw with regret the luster of it fading in America. In less than two years from the time of my departure, some distant assumptions, I'm sorry, distant symptoms were painfully suggested, the idea that the principles of the revolution were expiring on the soil that produced them. I received at the time a letter from a female literary correspondent, and in my answer to her, I expressed my fears on the head. I know, from the information I obtained upon the spot, that impressions that then distressed me, for I was proud of America, were but too well founded. She was turning her back on her own glory, and making hasty strides in the retrograde path of oblivion, but a spark from the altar of 76, unextinguished and unextinguishable through the long night of error, is again lighting up, in every part of the Union, the genuine name of rational liberty. As the French Revolution advanced its fix and attention of the world, and drew from the pension pen of Edmund Burke a furious attack, this brought me once more on the public theater of politics, and occasioned the pamphlet Rights of Man. It had the greatest run of any work ever published in the English language. The number of copies circulated in England, Scotland, and Ireland, besides translations into foreign languages, was between four and five hundred thousand. The principles of that work were the same as those in common sense, and the effects would have been the same in England as had been produced in America, could the vote of the nation been quietly taken, or had equal opportunities of consulting or acting existed. The only difference between the two works was that the one was adopted to the local circumstances of England, and the other to those of America. As to myself, I acted in both cases alike. I relinquished to the people of England, as I had done to those of America, all profits from the work. My reward existed in the ambition to do good, and the independent happiness of my own mind. But a faction, acting in disguise, was rising in America. They had lost sight of first principles. They were beginning to contemplate government as a profitable monopoly, and the people as hereditary property. It is, therefore, no wonder that the right of man was attacked by that faction, and its author continually abused. But let them go on, give them rope enough, and they will part, put an end to their own insignificance. There is too much common sense and independence in America to be the long the dupe of any faction, foreign or domestic. But in the midst of freedom we enjoy, the litigiousness of the papers, called federal, 
and I know not why they are called so, for they are in their principles anti-federal and despotic. It is a dishonor to the character of the country, and an injury to its reputation and importance abroad. They represent the whole people of America as destitute of public principles and private manners. As to any injury they can do at home to those whom they abuse or service they can render to those who employ them, it is to be set down to the account of noisy nothingness. It is on themselves the disgrace recoils, for the reflection easily re presents itself to every thinking mind, and those who abuse liberty when they possess it would abuse power could they obtain it, and therefore they may as well take as a general motto for all such papers. We are patrons, are not fit to be trusted with, pe with power. There is in America, more than in any other country, a large body of people who attend quietly to their farms or follow their several occupations, who pay no regard to the clamors of anonymous scribblers, who think for themselves and judge of government, not by the fury of newspaper writers, but by the prudent frugality of its measures, and the encouragement it gives to the improvement and prosperity of the country, and who, acting on their own judgment, never come forward in an election, but on some important occasion. When this body moves, all the little barkings of scribbling and witless curs pass for nothing. To say to this independent description of men, you must turn out such and such persons at the next election, for they have taken off a great many taxes and lessened the expenses of government. They have dismissed my son or my brother or myself from a lucrative office in which there was nothing to do. It is so is to show the cloven foot of faction and preach the language of ill-disguised mortification. In every part of the Union, this faction is in its agonies of death, and in proportion, as its fate approaches, gnashes its teeth struggles. My arrival has struck it as with hydrophobia, phobia. It is like the sight of water to canine madness. As this letter is intended to announce my arrival to my friends, and so my enemies, if I have any, for I ought to have none in America, and as introductory to others that will occasion follow, I shall close it by detailing the line of conduct I shall pursue. I have no occasion to ask, <clears throat> and do not intend to accept, any place or office in the government. There is none it could give me that would be any ways equal to the profits I could make as an author, for I have an established fame in the literary world, could I reconcile it to my principles to make money by my politics or religion. I must be in everything what I have ever been, a disinterested volunteer. My proper sphere of action is on the common floor of citizenship, and to honest men I give my hand and my heart freely. I have some manuscripts work to publish, of which I shall give proper notice, and some mechanical affairs to bring forward that will employ all my leisure time. I shall continue these letters as I see occasion, and as to the low party prints that choose to abuse me, they are welcome. I shall not descend to answer them. I have been too much used to such common stuff to take any notice of it. The government of England honored me with a thousand martyrdoms by burning an effigy in every town in that country, and their hearings here in America may do the same. As the affairs of the country to which I have returned are more important to the world and to me than of that I have lately left, for it is through this new world the old must be regenerated, if regenerated at all, I shall not take up the time of the reader with an account of scenes that have passed in France, many of which are painful to remember and horrid to relate, but come at once to the circumstances in which I find America on my arrival. Fourteen years and some more have pa produced a charge, or a change, at least among a part of the people, and I ask myself what it is. I meet or hear of thousands of my former connections who are men of the same principles and friendship as when I left them, but a nondescript race, and of, of, and of equivocal generation, assuming the name of Federalist, a name that describes no character or principle, good or bad, 
and may equally be applied to either, has since started with this rapidity of a mushroom, and like a mushroom, is wire withering on its rootless stalk. Are those men federalized to support the liberties of the country or to overthrow, overturn them? To add to its fair game or riot on its spoils? The name contains no defined idea. It is like John Adams' defining definition of a republic in his letter to Mr. Wythe of Virginia. In it, says he, an empire of law and not men. But as laws may be bad as well as good, an empire of laws may be the best of all governments or the worst of all tyrannies. But John Adams is a man of paradoxical heresies and consequently of a, a bewildering mind. He wrote a book entitled A Defense of the American Constitutions and the Principles of It are an Attack Upon Them. But the book is descended to the tomb of forgetfulness and the best fortune that can attend its author is quietly to follow his fate. John was not born for immortality, but to return to federalism. In the history of the parties and the names they assume, it often happens that they finish by the direct contrary principles with which they profess to begin, and thus it happened with federalism. During the time of the old Congress, the prior to the establishment of the federal government, the Continental Belt was too loosely buckled. The several states were united in name, but not in fact, and the nominal union had neither center nor circle. The laws of one state frequently interfered with, and sometimes opposed, those of another. Commerce between state and state was without protection, and confidence without a point to rest on. The condition the country was then in was aptly described by Petala Webster when he said, Thirteen slaves and near a hoop will make a barrel. If, then, by Federalist, it is to be understood one who is for the cementing the Union by a general government operating equally over all the states in all manners that embrace the common interest, and to which the authority of the states severally was not adequate for no one state can make laws to bind another. If, I say, by a Federalist, is meant a person of this description, and this is the origin of the name, I ought to stand first on the list of Federalists, for the proposition for establishing a general government over the Union came originally from me in 1783, and a written memorial to Chancellor Livingston, the Secretary of Foreign Affairs to Congress, Robert Morris, Minister of Finance, and his associate, Governor Morris, all of whom are now living, and we had a dinner and conference at Robert Morris's on the subject. The occasion was as followed. Congress had proposed a duty of 5% on importing articles, the money to be applied as a fund towards paying the interest of loans to be borrowed in Holland. The resolve was sent to the several states to be enacted into law. Rhode Island absolutely refused. I was on the trouble of journey to Rhode Island to reason with them on the subject. Some other of the states enacted it with alterations, each one as it pleased. Virginia adopted it and afterwards repealed it, and the affair came to nothing. It was then visible, at least to me, that either Congress must frame the laws necessary for the Union and send them to the several states to be enregistered without any alterations, which would in itself appear like usurpation on the one part and passive obedience on the other, or some method must be devised to accomplish the same end by constitutional principles, and the propositions I made in the memorial was to add a continental legislator to Congress to be elected by the several states. The proposition met the full approbation of the gentleman to whom it was addressed, and the conversation turned on the manner of bringing it forward. Governor Morris, in talking with me after dinner, wished to throw out the idea in the newspaper. I replied that I did not like to, to be always the prosperer of new things, and that I would have to assuming an appearance, and besides, that I did not think the country was quite wrong enough to be put right. I remember giving the same reason to Dr. Rush at Philadelphia and to General Gates, at whom's quarter I spent a day on my return from Rhode Island, and I suppose they will remember it because the observation seemed to strike them. But the embarrassments increasing, 
as they necessarily must from the want of a better cemented union, the state of Virginia proposed holding a commercial convention, and that convention, which was not sufficiently numerous, proposed that another convention with more extensive and better defined powers should be held at Philadelphia, May 10, 1787. When the plan of the federal government formed by this convention was proposed and submitted to the considerations of the several states, it was strongly objected to in each of them. But the objections were not on anti-federal grounds, but on constitutional points. Many were shocked at the idea of placing what is called executive powers in the hands of a single individual. To them, it had too much the form and appearance of a military government, or a despotic one. Others objected that the powers given to a president were too great, and that in the hands of ambitious and designing man it might grow into tyranny as it did in England under Oliver Cromwell, and as it has been since done in France. A republic must not only be so in its principles, but in its forms. The executive part of the federal government was made for a man, and those who consented against their judgment to place executive powers in the hands of a single individual reposed more on the supposed moderation of the person they had in view than on the wisdom of the measure itself. Two considerations, however, overcame all objections. The one was the absolute necessity of a federal government. The other, the reflections, or the rational reflections, that as government in America is founded on the representative system, any error in the first essay could be reformed by the same quiet and rational process by which the Constitution was formed, <clears throat> and that either by the generation then living, or by those who were to succeed. If ever America lose sight of this principle, she will no longer be the land of liberty, the father will become the assassin of the rights of the son, and his descendants be a race of slaves. As many thousands who were minors are grown up to manhood since the name of the Federals began, it became necessary, for their information, to go back and show the origins of the name, which is now no longer what it originally was. But it was the more necessary to do this in order to bring forward, in the open face of day, the apostasy of those who first called themselves Federalists. To them, it served as a cloak for treason, a mask for tyranny. Scarcely were they placed in the seat of power and office than Federalism was to be destroyed in the representative system of government, the pride and glory of America, and the palladium of her liberties, was to be overthrown and abolished. The next generation was not to be free. The son was to bend his neck beneath the father's foot and live, deprived of his right, under hereditary control. Among the men of this apostate description is to be the rank of ex-president, John Adams. It has been the political career of this man to begin with hypocrisy, proceeded with arrogance, and finish in contempt. May such be the fate of all such characters. I have had doubts of John Adams ever since the year 1776, in a conversation with me at the time concerning the pamphlet Confidence Sense. He censored it because it attacked the English form of government. John was for independence because he expected to be made great by it, but it was not difficult to perceive, for the surliness of his temper makes him an awkward hypocrite, that his head was a full of kings, queens, and knives as a pack of cards, but John has lost deal. When a man has concealed projects in his brains that he wants to bring forward, and fears will not succeed, he begins with it as a physicians do by suspecting poison. Try it first on an animal. If it agree with the stomach of the animal, he makes further experiments. This was the way John took. His brain was teeming with projects to overturn the liberties of America and the representative system of government, and he began by hinting it to little companies. The secretary of John Jay, an excellent painter and a poor politician, told me, in presence of another American, Daniel Parker, that in a company where himself was present, John Adams talked of making the government hereditary, and that as Mr. Washington had no children, it could be made hereditary in the family of Lund Washington. John 
had not impudence enough to propose himself in the first instance as the old French Normandy baron did, who offered to come over to be king of America, and if Congress did not accept his offer, that they would give him thirty thousand pounds for the generosity of it. But John, like a mole, was grubbing his way to it underground. He knew that Lund Washington was unknown, for nobody had heard of them, and that as the president had no children to succeed him, the vice president had, and if the treason had succeeded, and the hint with it, the goldsmith might be sent for the take measure of the head of John or his son for a golden wig. In this case, the good people of Boston might have for a king the man that they have rejected as a delegate. The representative system is fatal to ambition. Knowing as I do, the consumerate vanity of John Adams and the shallowness of his judgment, I can easily picture to myself that when he arrived at the federal city he was strutting in the pomp of his imagination before the presidential house or in the audience hall and exulting in the language of Nebuchadnezzar. As not, is not this great Babylon that I have built for the honor of my majesty, but in the unfortunate hour, or soon after, John, like Nebuchadnezzar, was driven from among men, and fled with the speed of a post-horse. Some of John's Adam's loyal subjects, I see, have been to present him with the address on his birthday, but the language they use is too tame for the occasion. Birthday addresses, like birthday odes, should not creep along like mild drops down a cabbage leaf, but roll into a torrent of poetical metaphor. I will give them a specimen for the next year. Here it is. When an ant, I'm traveling over the globe, lifts up its foot and puts it against the ground, it shakes the earth to its center. But you, the mighty ant of the east, was born, etc., 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 the center jumped upon the surface. This, gentlemen, is the proper style of address from a well-bred ants to the monarch of the ant hills, and as I never take pay for preaching, praying, politics, or poetry, I make you a present of it. Some people talk of impeaching John Adams, but I am for soft measures. I would keep him to make fun of. He will then answer one of ends for which he was born, and he ought to be thankful that I have arrived to take his part. I voted in earnest to save the life of one unfortunate king, and I now vote in jest to save another. It is my fate to always plague with fools, but to return to federalism and apostasy. The plan of the leaders of the faction was to overthrow the liberties of the new world and place government on the corrupt system of the old. They wanted to hold their powers by a more lasting tenure than the choice of their constituents. It is impossible to account for the conduct and the measures they adopted on any other ground. But to accomplish that object, a standing army and a parochial revenue must be raised, and to obtain these pretenses must be invented to deceive. Alarms of dangers that did not exist even in imagination, but in the direst spirit of lying, were spread abroad. Apostasy stalked through the land in the garb of patriotism, and the torch of treason blinded for a while the flame of liberty. For what purpose could an army of twenty-five thousand men be in wanted? A single reflection might have taught the most crudulous that, while the war raged between France and England, neither could spare man to invade America. For what purposes, then, could it be wanted? The case carries its own explanation. It was wanted for the purpose of destroying the representative system, for it could be employed for no other. Are these men Federalists? If they are, they are federalized to deceive and to destroy. The rage against Mr. Logan's patriotic and voluntary mission to France was excited by the shame they felt at the detection of the false alarms they had circulated, as to the oppositions given by the remnant of the faction to the repeal of the taxes laid on during the former administration, it is easy to account it for. The repeal of those taxes was a sentence of condemnation on those who laid them on, and in the oppositions they gave it that repeal they are to be considered 
in the light of criminals standing on their defense in the country as past judgments upon them. To elect and to reject is the prerogative of a free people. Since the establishment of independence, no period has arrived that so decidedly proves the excellence of the representative system of government and its superiority over every other. As the time we now live in, had America been cursed with John Adams' hereditary monarchy or Alexander Hamilton's Senate for life, she must have sought, in the doubtful contest of civil war, what she now obtains by the expression of public will. An appeal to elections decides better than an appeal to the sword. The reigns of terror that rage in America during the latter end of the Washington administration and the whole of that of Adams is enveloped in mystery to me. That there were men in the government hostile to the representative system was once their boast, through it as though it is now their overthrow, and therefore the fact is established against them. But that so large a mass of people should become the dupes of those who were loading them with taxes in order to load them with chains and deprive them of the right of election can be ascribed only to the species of wildfire range lighted up by falsehoods that not only act without reflection, but is too impudious to make any. There is a general and striking difference between the genuine effects of truth and the effects of falsehoods believed to be true. Truth is naturally benign, but falsehoods believed to be truth is always furious. The former delights in serenity, is mild and persuasive, and seeks not the auxiliary aid of invention. The latter sticks at nothing. It has naturally no morals. Every lie is welcome that suits its purpose. It is the innate character of the thing to act in this manner and the criterion by which it may be known, whether in politics or religion. When anything is attempted to be supported by lying, it is presumptive evidence that the thing so supported is a lie also. The stock on which a lie can be grafted must be of the same species as the graft. What is becoming of the mighty clamor of French invasion, and the cry that our country is in danger, and taxes and armies must be raised to defend it. The danger is fled with the faction that created it. And what is worst of all, the money is fled too. It is I only that have committed the hostilities of invasion, and all the artillery pop guns are prepared for action. Poor fellows, how they foam. They set half their own partisans in laughter. For among ridiculous things, nothing is more ridiculous than ridiculous rage. But I hope they will not leave off. I shall lose half my greatness when they cease to lie. So far as respect, respects myself, I have reason to believe, and a right to say, that the leaders of the reign of terror in America and the leaders of the reign of terror in France during the time of Robespierre were in character the same sort of men. Or how is it to be accounted for that I was persecuted by both at the same time? When I was voted out of the French convention... The reason assigned for it was I was a foreigner. When Robespierre had me seized in the night and imprisoned in Luxembourg, when I remained for eleven months, he assigned no reason for it. But when he proposed bringing me to the tribunal, which was like sending me at once to the scaffold, he then assigned a reason. And the reason was, for the interest of America as well as France, pour les interests de l'Amérique ante que de la France. The words are in his own handwriting and reported to the convention by the committee appointed to examine his papers and are printed in their report, with this reflection added to them. Why Thomas Paine more than another? Because he contributed to the liberty of both worlds. There must have been a coalition in sentiment, if not in fact, between the territories of America and the territories of France, and Robespierre must have known it, or he could not have had the idea of putting America into the bill of accusations against me. Yet these men, these terrorists of the New World, who were waiting in the de devotion of their hearts for the joyful news of my destruction, are the same banditti who are now bellowing, bellowing in all the 
hackneyed language of hackneyed hypocrisies about humanity and petty and often about something they call infidelity and they finish with the chorus of crucify him crucify him i am becoming so famous among them they can not eat or drink without me i serve them as a standing dish and they cannot make up a bill or fare if i am not in it but there is one dish and that's the choice choiciest of all that they have not presented on the table and it's time they should they have not yet accused providence of infidelity yet according to their outrageous petty she must be as bad as thomas paine she has protected him in all his dangers patronized him in all his undertakings encouraged him in all of his ways and rewarded him at last by bringing him in safety and in health to the promised land this is more than she did by the Jews and the chosen people that they tell us she ought brought out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage, for they all died in the wilderness, and Moses too. I was one of the nine members that composed the first committee of the Constitution. Six of them have been destroyed. Sias and myself have survived, he by bending with the times and I by not bending. The other survivor joined Rospierre. He was seized and imprisoned in his turn, and sentenced to transportation. He has since apologized to me for having signed the warrant by saying he felt himself in danger and was obliged to do so. Harold Schulis, an acquaintance of Mr. Jefferson and a good patriot, was my suppliant as member of the Committee of Constitution. That is, he was to supply my place if I had not accepted or had resigned, being next in number of votes to me. <clears throat> he was imprisoned in the Luxembourg with me, was taken to the tribunal and the guillotine, and I, his principal, was left. There were two foreigners in the convention, anarchists, Klutz, and myself. We were both put out of the convention by the same vote, arrested by the same order, and carried to prison together the same night. He was taken to the guillotine, and I was left, again left. Joe Barlow was with us when we went to prison. Joseph Lebanon, one of the vilest characters that ever existed and who made the streets of Arras run with blood, was my suppliant. As member of the convention for the Department of Pas de Calas, when I was put out of the convention, he came and took my place. When I was liberated from prison and voted again into the convention, he was sent to the same prison and took my place there, and he was sent to the guillotine instead of me. He supplied my place all the way through. One hundred and sixty-eight persons were taken out of the Luxembourg in one night, and a hundred and sixty of them guillotined the next day, of which I n now know I was to have been one, and the manner I escaped that fate is curious, and has all the appearance of accident. The room in which I was lodged was on the ground floor, and one of a long range of rooms under a gallery, and the door of it opened outwards and flat against the wall, so that when it opened, the inside of the door appeared outward, and the contrary when it was shut. I had three comrades, fellow prisoners with me, Joseph Van Hool of Burgess, since president of the municipality of that town, Michael Rubes, and Charles Bastini of Levain. When persons by scores and by hundreds were to be taken out of the prison for the guillotine, it was always done in the night, and those who performed that office had a private mark or signal by which they knew what rooms to go to and what numbers to take. We, as I have stated, were four, and the door of our room was marked, unobserved by us, with that number in chalk, but it happened, if happening is a proper word, that the mark was put on the door uh, when the door was open, and flat against the wall, and thereby came on the inside when we shut it at night, and the destroying angel passing by it. A few days after this, Rose Pierre fell, and Mr. Monroe arrived and reclaimed me and invited me to his house. During the whole of my imprisonment, prior to the fall of Rospierre, there was no time when I could think my life worth twenty-four hours, and my mind was made up to meet its fate. The Americans in Paris went in a body to the convention to reclaim me, but without success. There was no party among them with respect to me. My only hope was rested on the government of America that it would remember me but the icy heart of ingratitude in whatever man is to be placed has neither feeling nor sense of honor. 
The letter of Mr. Jefferson has served to wipe away the reproach and done justice to the mass of the people of America. When a party was forming in the latter end of 1777 and beginning of 1778, of which John Adams was one, to remove Mr. Washington from the command of the army on the complaint that he did nothing, I wrote the fifth number of the crisis and published it at Lancaster. Congress, then being at Yorktown in Pennsylvania to ward off the mediated blow, for though I well knew that the black times of 76 were the natural consequences of his want of military judgment and the choice of positions into which the army was put about New York and New Jersey, I could see no possible advantage and nothing but mischief that could arise by distracting the armies into parties which could have been the case had the intended motion gone on. General Lee, who was a sarcastic genius, joined to a great fund of military knowledge, was perfectly right when he said, We have no business on islands and in the bottom of bogs, where the enemy, by the aid of its ships, can bring its whole force against a part of ours and shut it up. This had like to have been the case at New York, and it was the case at Fort Washington, and would have been the case at Fort Lee if General Greene had not moved instantly off the first news of the enemy's approach. I was with Greene through the whole of that affair and know it perfectly. But though I came forward in defense of Mr. Washington when he was attacked and made the best that could that could be made of a series of blunders that had nearly ruined the country, he left me to perish when I was in prison. But, as I told him of it to his lifetime, I should not now bring it up if the ignorant impertinence of some of the federal papers who are pushing Mr. Washington forward as their stalking horse did not make it necessary. That gentleman did not perform his part in the revolution better, nor with more honor than I did mine, and the part, and the one part, that was necessary as the other. He accepted as a present though he was already rich, a hundred thousand acres of land in America, and left me to occupy six foot of earth in France. I wish, for his own reputation, he had acted with more justice, but it was always known of Mr. Washington by those who knew him best that he was of such icy and death-like constitution that he neither loved his friend nor hated his enemies. But, be this as it may, I see no reason that a difference between Mr. Washington and me should be made a theme of discord with the other people. There are those who may see merit in both without making themselves partisans of either, and with this reflection I close the subject. As to the hypocritical abuse thrown out by the Federalists on other subjects, I, re recommend, I recommend to them the observation of a commandment that existed before their Christian or Jew existed. Thou shalt make a covenant with thy senses, with thine eye, that it behold no evil, with thine ear, that it hear no evil, and with thy tongue, that it speak no evil, with thy hands, that it commits no evil. If the Federalists will follow this commandment, they will leave off lying. And... That is the end of the letters to the citizens of the United States by Thomas Paine.